Welcome to the Dakota Live Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Morier. The goal of this podcast is to help you better know the people behind investment decisions. We introduce you to chief investment officers, manager research professionals, sales leaders, and other important players in the industry who will help you sell in between the lines and better understand the investment sales ecosystem. If you're not familiar with Dakota and their Dakota Live content, please check out dakota.com to learn more about their services. Uh, before we get started, I need to read a brief disclosure. This content is provided for informational purposes and should not be relied upon as recommendations or advice about investing in securities. All investments involve risk and may lose money. Dakota does not guarantee the accuracy of any of the information provided by the speaker who is not affiliated with Dakota. Not a solicitation, testimonial, or an endorsement by Dakota or its affiliates. Nothing herein is intended to indicate approval of support or a recommendation of the investment advisor or its supervised persons by Dakota. Today's episode is brought to you by Dakota Marketplace. Are you tired of constantly jumping between multiple databases and channels to find the right investment opportunities? Introducing Dakota Marketplace the comprehensive institutional and intermediary database built by fundraisers for fundraisers. With Dakota Marketplace, you'll have access to all channels and asset classes in one place, saving you time and streamlining your fundraising process. Say goodbye to the frustration of searching through multiple databases and say hello to a seamless and efficient fundraising experience. Sign up now and see the difference Dakota Marketplace can make for you. Visit dakotamarketplace.com today. Well, I am very happy to introduce our audience to Brian Crawford, Director of Investments at the John Templeton Foundation. Brian, welcome to the studio. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, before we get started, I want to quickly introduce uh, my partner on the desk, Steve Aiken of Dakota. Steve, welcome back. Yeah, excited to be here. Yeah, it's nice to have you here again. We're really excited to have Brian here in the studio, located not too far away, but uh, we're happy you made the, the trip into Philadelphia to be with us. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to read your background for our audience so they can better familiarize uh, themselves with you and your experience. Brian Crawford is the Director of Investments at the John Templeton Foundation. In his role, Brian oversees the investment team and all activity related to oversight and management of the foundation's investment portfolio. This includes portfolio management, asset allocation, and investment selection. Previously, Brian was a partner at Colonial Consulting, now Crucial Partners. For more than 15 years, Brian served as portfolio manager for multiple foundation and endowment clients, while also serving as executive director of research, leading investment strategy and the team of analysts in the firm's research efforts. Prior to his time at Crucial, Brian held several roles as an investment analyst and or investment consultant at Bank of America, Asset Consulting Group, and Arthur Anderson. Brian is a CFA charter holder. Uh, Brian received his master's in finance from Boston University and his BA in both finance and accounting from the University of Missouri. Brian, thank you again for being here. Congratulations on all your success. And we're looking forward to getting into it. We always like to start with the beginning on the show, force you to go way back to when you were thinking about this career. Um, so thinking about your days in St. Louis, uh, you know, did you know coming out of school, you were, you were interested in the, in the investment management industry? I did, I did. I, um, I loved the world of investments dating back to probably middle school, in fact. And um, I can still recall my business econ class in high school, I think it was a sophomore at the time, and we would pick stocks. And I was big on Nike, mostly because Bo Jackson is <laughs> the best athlete of all time. I still believe that. But, you know, the teacher was kind of explaining, well, what, what more is, is your, do you have passion for, for Nike? And she started talking about fundamentals and understanding earnings growth and uh, competitors and all of these components that were complete unknowns. And I was just intrigued by that. You know, so many things are, with math, there's an answer. With science, there's, an, there's for most science questions, there's an answer. With investments, there's no answer. Uh, we'll find out afterwards. Uh, and I thought that was super intriguing. We can apply discipline combined with so much uh, unknowns that it's always changing and always evolving. So that was always intriguing to me. So I knew uh, going into college um, exactly what I wanted to do or I didn't quite understand the industry yet, but I definitely knew I wanted to be in the space. Well, other than Bo Jackson, was there anyone in particular who helped you point <laughs> in that direction? So I was in, in college and uh, by sophomore year, I had uh, started an internship at AG Edwards uh, for a broker. That was a great experience. Uh, and then the very next uh, year, I had the opportunity to go into the, the main office and work on the sell side analyst team as an intern, not really doing the real work, but I uh, did that for a few years before I graduated, which was fantastic. And, um, you know, what I would say about that is that I understood the industry and what there was potentially out there, but not quite the 
the, the tentacles that existed in that space. Unfortunately for uh, someone by the name of Bruce Burkle, who had to oversee the interns uh, at the time, I think he was fantastic for me. He kind of shed a lot of light on what the opportunity set was out there, what, what things could be available to me, and um, I think pointed me in the right direction. So I, I'm very appreciative of, of Bruce and, and many others along the way, but Bruce certainly set, set my path for me. Well, for my students at Drexel University, they're in the process of you know graduating or thinking about graduating this year. And one of the things that they think about is where they wanna be. And you made a big change. You started in St. Louis and then you relocated to New York City. So what was that decision like for you at that point in your career, making that switch from Midwest to the, West, to the East Coast? Pretty simple. I. Um, uh, I love St. Louis, grew up in St. Louis, still a family in St. Louis. I had been working in St. Louis for a handful of years and just felt that you know I wanted to expand my opportunity set uh, in the investment space, as well as potentially compete with, I think, uh, more and more people. I'm not saying better, pe just more people in that space. So I knew I wanted to be in an investment hub in terms of a major city. And, and uh, I went to my boss at the time at Bank of America, B of A. And and said, hey, would you mind if I work out of Chicago in the Chicago office, which is pretty close to St. Louis? And I think he knew, he said, he even told me, he said, uh, if we let you do that, you'll leave in six months. There's no chance you're, you're sticking around. He said, what do you think about New York? We have people in New York. Would you be willing to go to New York? And I said, absolutely. At that moment, he said, done. That's how I ended up in New York. I basically just said, I, Nothing against St. Louis, but was ready to kind of move into a, uh, a bigger city and wanted those opportunities. You started with a very large firm and then you ended up moving to a boutique or a more nimble shop in Colonial Consulting, now Crucial. So uh, we have James Bell coming on the show in a few weeks. Uh, so we'll get a sense how they're approaching manager research and selection today. Uh, but looking back at your nearly 16 years with the firm, congratulations. How did you uh, and the firm approach manager research and, and how did that evolve over your time at the Shop. Great questions. Uh, so I'll, I'll tackle it in two different ways. Um, one is I would say when I first got there, uh, and this isn't a negative, but we looked for what I would call middle of the road um, opportunities, investment opportunities. And those are tried long term, long standing investment strategies, firms that have been around for a long time. Um, everybody knows those strategies. They're not too much in terms of deviations. And the people that are leading those, those strategies have been around for, for quite some time too. And I would say we slowly started to evolve and, and move away from just the process to identifying talent and that edge that you're looking for in, in certain investment managers. We should owe a lot of that to Mike Miller, who was now the CIO at, um, at Crucial. He was a big proponent of searching for that edge. And that really led us to younger talent um, that's out there, arguably the next generation of talent. And so it uh, expanded our opportunity set, not just with younger talent, but also if you think about a lot of emerging managers or managers that would be classified as DEI today, that was still arguably a very much untapped market, um, really led us to finding more opportunities in that space. And I, again, credit Mike Miller for a lot of the work that he's, he's done in that space. But I think we all grabbed onto that um, with two hands and, and was, was absolutely, you know, owning that kind of evolvement uh, that we kind of moved through. So really excited about what happened in that space. About six years into my tenure at, at Colonial Consulting at the time, they then also approached me to take over research. Um, and I was um, happy to do so, but I had a handful of things that I really wanted to accomplish. And it really starts with, with structure. I wanted an open, honest debate. I wanted ownership and I wanted talent discovery. And so if I can just touch on a few of those things, or all four of those things, you know, first on structure, you go into research meetings, you ask what, where analysts have been, Some, well, someone was in San Francisco, another one was in Florida, another one's in Chicago, and they talk about the managers that they met with. And it arguably, unless you've met that manager yourself, it's the first time you're hearing about it. And we have a room of 20, 25, 30 people at times. And so it would just be a single person talking and maybe there'd be a few questions, but they'd somewhat be generic because you didn't have an intimate knowledge of what that manager was like. Um, and I wanted to kind of clean that a bit and have more structure around our research meetings and with an agenda, with uh, meeting notes ahead of time, any kind of materials ahead of time so that all 25 people around the room could engage in the conversation. Uh, and I thought that was incredibly important. The other part of that is, you know, our analysts were meeting 700, 800 managers a year, and you would kind of look at the end of the year and you'd see maybe 100 notes. And I thought, well, I get it. The analysts are building this great repository of information for themselves, knowing who's good and who's bad, player, bad players in the industry. But that's their information. 
at the end of the day, the, the firm owns that information and we need to share that with everybody. And so requiring notes for every single meeting ever taken, sharing those notes with everyone so that if I wasn't in San Francisco meeting with managers, at least I'd have a sense of how those meetings took place. And it also helped facilitate conversations in our meetings. So I think our meetings became much more robust and, and collegial and, and very conversational, which um, are all positives in terms of getting to the best ideas as we move forward. And the second tenet I, I wanted to touch on was op open and honest debate. Um, and we touched briefly on the fact that I spent a little bit of time at Bank of America. Um, I started as an analyst, a senior analyst, but midway through they made me a research manager. So I was overseeing the senior analyst at the time and, and uh, in that role, developing a lot of process around how we look for managers and what we're looking for. And one thing I enacted when I was at B of A was a devil's advocate program. And I really wanted to um, carry that through when I came over as head of research at, um, at Colonial, uh, now Crucial. Uh, and so one of the first things I did was implement a devil's advocate program, not for any negative reasons, but really to create debate in our meetings, uh, one. Uh, and so, you know, I mentioned before 700, 800 manager meetings a year, eventually five, 10, 20 of those will bubble up into ideas that are probably gonna make our, our short list, uh, our recommended list. And when we started to get to that point, at some point, the analysts that have been meeting six, seven times with those managers are now in love with those managers. You know, they're, they're almost on the same side of the table. And I wanted to make sure we kept objective views on that. And so I would actually assign an analyst completely outside of that, maybe even that entire group, to come in and collect information, maybe even take a couple meetings with them and then find every reason possible not to make an investment in that manager. And as we know, every manager has some flaws or something to kind of poke at. And um, we wanted to highlight those, bring those into our research meetings, have an open and honest conversation about why wouldn't we invest with this manager to the point that we actually included those in our reports that go out to clients. So still today, I think they're still in there. Reasons not to invest exist as a section in our reports. And I've carried that to my new role as well, reasons not to invest, because I think one, we, we want to understand we're not Pollyannish in our views about every single manager that's out there. Every manager has some issues. But I also want to know when I will sell a manager before I need to sell or terminate a manager. And I think that's important. And those are often found in the reasons not to invest. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it, it really created an open debate. And again, I, my, my entire goal was around dialogue, whether that's structure or this open and honest debate in our research meetings. The third is ownership. You know, I take ownership to heart. Uh, and I take that as a consultant and then currently as my, in my role as director of investments at, at John Templeton. As a consultant, I used to sit across the table of committees and perf if performance was great, they'd say, great job. If performance was bad, it's my fault. Um, I'd own that. I'd, go, I'd take it home with me. I'd think about what could I have done different? What, what, what changes in this portfolio need to take place? What doesn't need to take place? Sometimes inaction is an action as well. And we wanted to be aware of what we could or couldn't do. And so... I own those wins and those losses every day, but then you get to research. And if research, if the analysts among that research team, their goal is to just bring ideas, funnel an entire basket of opportunities and let you figure it out. There's no ownership there. We're completely misaligned. And I wanted to create alignment between all the way down from analyst up to consultants because we all own those portfolios. And this really stems from, and I'll, I'll, I'll steal from someone I admire greatly, but uh, I started working with a, an organization called the Seattle Foundation, Community Foundation in Seattle. Um, and uh, Mary Pugh, founder and, and head of CIO of Pugh Capital, was the chair of that committee uh, right when I got there. Uh, and she just took on that role too. So her first meeting was my first meeting. And I still remember to this day, something that completely changed the dynamic of, of our relationship, meaning the foundations in my relationship. And she opened the, the first meeting with a conversation to the, to the committee, not to me, and said, uh, and it was an advisory relationship, it was, this was not OCIO. And she said uh, to the committee, Brian's gonna come with ideas. Um, we're probably gonna like most of those, we might not like them all, but at the end of the day, we own the portfolio. It's not his portfolio, it's not his success or his failure, it's our success and our failure. And immediately I felt I was on the same side of the table as them and we were working together. And our conversations from that point forward were fantastic. And I, I wanted to make sure I carried that internally as well, that we all own portfolios. So ownership is, is really key. So no idea 
is not without ownership. And so any idea that's quote unquote recommended or approved for investment needed to have at least two members of the team with their name on paper. Uh, I own these names. I also created a research portfolio. You know, sometimes consultants or senior leaders kind of have the strongest voices, but what's the best ideas that are out there by person? Um, and what would you construct that's different? And we start tracking those things. And so knowing what the best ideas were, people felt, oh, I think ownership to the investment ideas that they were bringing to the table from senior analysts all the way down to more of our junior analysts. Um, and then that last piece is talent discovery. And I think it's connected to ownership. If you think about, again, senior voices, kind of the loudest room, loudest voice in the room, whether we're talking about research meetings or even outside of uh, the research meetings, it's hard to find rising stars in that kind of framework. Uh, and sometimes the rising stars are better than the people that have been doing it for 15 years. And we'll never discover them because the loudest voice is those senior members. So I wanted to have ownership on the names. And then we can also have those a analysts or junior analysts start to present and give ideas of their own uh, in meetings and why they support such, uh, such an investment. Why didn't they put their name on a different one that the senior people put it on? Um, and it allowed us to start to not only see this visually, uh, but also track it metrically um, uh, to see who our rising stars are. Thank you for sharing all that. I have to say, one of the things I love about this podcast is that we get that kind of time to hear those types of views, even if it was for 16 years at a prior role. Uh, we're grateful for that. Sometimes, as Steve knows very well, the conference circuit, we get these little sound bites here and there. And then as salespeople, we go back and we try to kind of scotch tape them together to figure out what the formula is. So thank you for sharing all that. It was very interesting. I think you did name uh, the episode, Reasons Not to Invest with the John Templeton Foundation. It might end up being our, our title. So so thank you for sharing that as well. Well, congratulations, this is the third time on your three-year anniversary with the Templeton Foundation. So for our audience who are less familiar with the foundation, uh, more than three decades after its creation, the John Templeton Foundation continues to manifest the character of its founder, Sir John Templeton, uh, who passed away in 2008. He began his rise on Wall Street in 1937 and proved over many decades that he was one of the greatest global stock pickers of the 20th century. So we're gonna be channeling Sir John's investment and philanthropic f philosophy uh, for our audience over the, over the next hour or so. Uh, but could you talk to us more about the foundation's mis mission, both philanthropically and, and financially? Yeah, Sir John was a legend, is a legend uh, in the investment industry. And so simply seeing his name when this opportunity uh, came to me was super exciting. Uh, but then to understand the mission that this foundation is working on is was very intriguing to me as well. And, you know, as you pointed out, founded in 1987, the John Templeton Foundation um, is really trying to provide grants and, and, and service research in so many different areas, so many different uh, spaces uh, from evolution to discovery of the black holes to um, areas of curiosity or our free will uh, or forgiveness. Our theme this year for the entire year is about love. Um, and so, all of these components, you know, helping human flourishing um, is just a fantastic opportunity. A lot of cross-sectional between science and religion. We cover all religions um, in, our, in our research and our work. Just a fantastic organization to be a part of. We have over you know, three plus billion dollars in assets and we grant out over hundred million dollars a year. I think that ranks in the top 25 in terms of grant making foundations in the US. So not only are we, I think we're doing some really phenomenal work, but we have a lot of um, assets or power to put behind that to really make an impact. So it's, it's the power of those things. And of course, you know, Sir John known as a great investor, but he spent much of his later life. Uh, he's a great philanthropic uh, leader, uh, quite honestly. And he's done a lot of fantastic work when he was here. And I think all of us at the foundation look to carry on that mission as best as, as best as possible. Thanks Brian, again, for being here. Uh, sounds like it's very rewarding being a part of a foundation like this to fund some of these missions uh, that you guys are focusing on. Um, but when thinking about the investment team in order to fund these sort of uh, projects, um, can you just give us an overview of you, your team, what you guys are looking for from an asset class perspective and how that coverage of the team is kind of divvied out? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's probably, I got a simple answer. Um, we, Sir John had a, he made his mark. Um, he's invested in a lot of different asset classes, but he made his mark in public equities. And he's been a, was a big proponent of transparency and liquidity. Um, and that carries through in how this portfolio is structured as well. Guidelines, policies, et cetera, that really dictate 
where we tend to dedicate a significant portion of our assets, and that tends to be public equity. So when I first joined the foundation, there were no alternatives at all in the portfolio, and we've only maybe dipped our toe in just a little bit. Um, and quite honestly, by structure, we'll not have a significant amount that's not in traditional assets. So traditional fixed income, traditional equities becomes a big part of our overall portfolio. Uh, and for that reason, we tend to have a pretty lean team. Uh, I don't need to dedicate and you need to dedicate a handful of people to private assets, for example, or, or hedge funds, et cetera. Um, Again, we might look for opportunities there, but most of our work is done in public equities with public fixed income uh, as a secondary. So I have a very lean team, two members, one that's much more kind of data management, data, data aggregation. The other is a phenomenal analyst that works closely with me on really trying to source and find great manager ideas that are out there. I think, again, staying true to what uh, Sir John had intended, um, but also fit with um, how we can manage the portfolio as best as possible. Brian, are you utilizing any external advisory relationships? Do you have a consultant? So no consultant. So all of our, what I call primary or traditional due diligence is done in-house. So it's my, my, our team um, out there meeting with managers, um, portfolio construction, all of that is done in-house as well. We do outsource our operational due diligence. Uh, you know, I think that requires significant interest and, and effort. Uh, and quite honestly, I think I would need to dedicate two or three analysts to that. So uh, doubling my team size for what I call ODD or operational due diligence, I think is not efficient use of our, our capital. So we do outsource to Allborn our operational due diligence work. Um, in addition to that, of course, being a lean team, we need a lot of tools in terms of software and, and technology. And so, most of it's on, on risk metrics, factor analyses, downside data work, um, uh, returns-based analysis, things like that. Uh, we subscribe to a handful of different providers uh, from a software and, and data provider perspective, in addition to some macro stuff. Yes, we absolutely take advantage of, of others that are out there, but we're not using a, a consultant. That makes sense, Smith. Thank you for sharing. So starting with the top down, how does the Templeton Foundation look at the world in terms of allocation? You mentioned that you're primarily focused on public market equities, public market fixed income, but within those two segments, is it a traditional look at non-US versus US emerging markets, investment grade? Trade, you know, versus high yield, for example. So how are you thinking about the world from an allocation perspective? So a few things. One is with most foundations and endowments, you have all these different asset classes to think about and a lot of time is spent on asset allocation. We do too. It's the most important component at, by far. Um, but knowing that such a large portion of our portfolio is dedicated to public equities, I tend to think of us more like almost like an investment manager in terms of what we're doing. So I spend a great deal of energy on understanding the risks that are inside every, that the, the one component of the portfolio that we have that's so large, which is public equities, breaking down as many lenses as I possibly can on, on understanding event risks, geopolitical risks, um, overlaps that might not be primary, but secondary overlaps that exist. What's the forward thought process behind our managers, not what they've done currently or where they've been before, and understanding how all of that's gonna actually uh, maneuver inside the portfolio that I have today. And then of course, apply that to the biases that I'd like to have in the portfolio. When I think about how investment managers tend to think they're constructing their portfolio and thinking about convictions and thinking about how they uh, allocate to positions and, and all of these ramifications, whether it's risk or opportunity, I tend to think about that much more than I think about some of the other uh, components that you're, my, my peers do. Well, I know you have some strong views about manager selection versus portfolio construction. So where, where do you see the value add? Getting back from Brinson and Bebauer to many studies since, asset allocation is obviously, the, it's always historically been, it's been proven statistically the, the most important component of what we could possibly do. And so getting that right is important, even in a more uh, simplified portfolio that we're looking at, uh, getting the allocation right is by far the most important. Second to that, of course, is still manager research. I mean, teams, teams of 20, 30 are dedicated to find out there scouring the universe, looking for great managers and opportunities that exist uh, across all geographies, all, all spaces that are out there. Again, those are the first, by far, one and two, in terms of what's important to a successful portfolio. But I find that there are allocators and consultants that kind of stop there. And so when, especially when you have multiple asset classes that are out there, as an example, if you had broken down your asset classes and you ended up with say an 8% allocation to US small cap equities, 4% to US small value, 4% to small growth. Um, or maybe you have three managers, one's a micro manager, micro cap manager. Um, but generally speaking, you've kind of done all your work, you found great managers and you allocate. You know, if I 
took a step back and I meet with investment managers and we've done all of this fantastic work. Process is there, philosophy is in line. I see the edge. Uh, uh, they got a great team in place. The PM's fully engaged. You know, every component is actually there. And then we get down to the point where we're talking about portfolio construction. And then I say, hey, can I see a current snapshot of your portfolio? And I look at it and it's 20 names, 5% each. I'm a little disappointed. And I, I, there are managers that can absolutely do that and they rebalance right back to it. But generally speaking, an investment manager has a high conviction in the name and you'll see a 15% stake in that one. And, and it could be for risk purposes, it could be for compounding purposes. And then you see these stub positions that are one or 2% stakes and they have high risk, but high reward opportunities. And they've been thoughtful in how they've constructed their portfolio. Paul Tudor Jones and Stanley Druckenmiller. I mean, they've, you've seen quotes come out from these fantastic investors that have mentioned that their batting average is below 50%. Uh, they have more failures, they're lo losers than they do winners, but their slugging percentage is where they've made all their money. Um, and that's through conviction. So when you have a great idea in your portfolio, you double down or you triple down in those names. Uh, and some of the best investors that are out there have made their money on their convictions. And again, I think, why can't we translate that to the allocators? And I'm not saying, I, I think a lot of allocators do. I, in fact, I respect the ones that are spent a, a great deal of energy thinking about portfolio construction, thinking about the risks that they have in the portfolio. But that's important to me. And it takes a lot of work um, to really think about position sizing and how we allocate to those convictions appropriately and, and adjust the portfolio to those things. And at the end of the day, maybe they only matter to you know, adding five, 10, 15 basis points, but 10 basis points to me is three and a half million dollars, $35 million. Um, that matters um, to me. So if I can you know, bring in you know, even $100,000 or $200,000 of capital, by a little bit of extra work, I'll absolutely do that. And I just think there's a laziness with stopping at the manager selection side and you need to move a little bit further in there. Well, you talked about your manager's rebalancing. How about your views on rebalancing as it, as it pertains to the foundation, your overall asset allocation? Yeah, it's a great question. Probably pull out a few more quotes if I, if I'll I can. I'll take them, we'll take them. First of all, across asset classes, absolutely. Everybody I think does that, should do that. Um, Markets move, things change. You need to rebalance and trim your wins, um, recapitalize where you need to recapitalize. But I think it's within asset classes that people tend to have a different view. Uh, and uh, I, would, I would argue that the, the, there's an industry view that these are differing views. Um, so I'll touch on two. One is, um, you know, I'll quote Peter Lynch and I'll butcher his quote, but something to the effect of uh, cutting your flowers and letting your weeds grow or vice versa. You know, you should always let, you know, water those flowers and cut the weeds, um, which is effectively implies let your winners run uh, and move on from your losers. But I'd also quote Sir John in terms of, you know, invest at the point of maximum pessimism, uh, that contrarian view where maybe these aren't losers, they've just been out of favor for a period of time. And so it sounds like those are conflicting views, but I don't think they are. I think that as an allocator, I'm dealing with managers, not positions or stocks or bonds. Um, and so we do have winners and losers in our portfolio. Um, but I would argue that the way I look at our portfolio is in two different lenses. And one is, um, do I have compounders, these long-term great performers that kind of are uh, almost market agnostic. They can deliver in down markets, they can deliver in up markets, generally speaking, and are these long-term compounders. And I wanna to allocate to those and let those flowers grow. But I also think there are great managers out there that tend to have a little bit of tailwind in their backs, or sometimes those are headwinds, they are macro forces, they are events that are taking place, they are dislocations in the market, and we can capitalize on those. And um, not that they aren't great investors themselves, but I do wanna rebalance from those when that market opportunity isn't there. And I think Sir John would say, you know, kind of run into the fire, uh, you know, uh, the burning house uh, when there's an opportunity there, but eventually that op opportunity can dry up. And so if a manager is being driven by those opportunities, I'll rebalance from those. Um, and again, at the end of the day, whether you're a compounder or kind of this, what I call factor driven strategy, there are limits. And I think about that position sizing that I have in place and ensuring that I'm not over allocated regardless of being a compounder, because at some point those risks kind of grow on you and become a bigger problem over time. So I don't think it's one lens that anyone should look at. I think it's a, a, a multi-lens approach to investing and it includes both of those, those quotes. All right, Brian, appreciate all your comments thus far. And there's a great overview of how you think about the foundation's portfolio, uh, but maybe, you know, 
take a step back as far as the underlying manager process goes. Um, definitely our audience would love to hear kind of how you think about um, how you do underwrite these managers and maybe some recommendations when thinking about reaching out to the foundation, best practices, reaching out, um, what the next steps typically look like for you to finally get a manager through the door yeah. and into the portfolio. First, I'd say we get incoming calls and, and emails all the time. Uh, and the one criteria I have is that uh, I typically just don't take a meeting. I, I typically say, send me your deck, uh, preferably some past quarterly letters. Uh, we'd like to do some work beforehand. I don't want to waste their time. I don't want to waste our time. We need to be efficient with everyone's time to see one, if it's something that's of interest of ours. And then of course, if, it, is it, if it's even a fit. Um, for example, I mentioned before, private investments. Um, that's not a high priority for us right now because of the limitations that we have. So I'm not taking too many meetings in that space um, right now. Um, so really kind of allowing us to do some work ahead of time is, is process from a process standpoint to make sure, again, sure, make sure we're efficient with, with our time and theirs is critical. So, but once we review them, a manager or an opportunity and, and see some interest in that, we'll open up with the first meeting, whether it's Zoom call in our office, in their office. Um, we're on the road quite a bit, um, trying to really sit across the table from managers. And our process is, I would arguably, pretty simple. Uh, we, we want clean and, and repeatable process and what they're actually trying to do. Um, so repeatability and just clearness around and transparency about what they're actually doing is, is really important to us. The next step is really identifying a discernible edge because there's so many managers that are out there. What's the edge that this manager has that others don't do it playing in the same space, playing in the same sandbox. And if we can't identify what that edge is, um, there are many other managers doing the exact same thing. So what kind of value is that going to bring to us uh, in the portfolio? Um, the next thing is really around PM engagement. I've come across um, meetings where the analysts are, know their positions inside and out. And if that doesn't translate up to the decision makers, the people that are actually making allocations and making changes, that's disappointing. I love to sit across. I mean, I, it's a, what a privilege to get us to sit across from some of these brilliant investors that have been doing it for decades and some that are haven't been doing it for decades. But either way, they're just brilliant investors, which at a minimum I get to take with me and kind of frame my own views about the world and what's happening and where the opportunities lie, where the risks lie. Um, and so that's happening all the time too. I take meetings just for that alone at times, but I also want to know that everybody on the, at the table is engaged um, and understand what they have and what they don't have in their portfolio. And if, if there's a bit of a disconnect there, that's a huge red flag from our standpoint too. The other piece is, and the, the last piece at the manager side is really around humility. If a manager can't identify mistakes, that everybody's made mistakes. If they can't identify mistakes they've made in the past and not willing to kind of share those. In fact, I love it when a manager starts with their mistakes because they're learning from those. And, uh, and more importantly, how am I gonna know how they're gonna react or behave when the next problem comes through and the next event that they're in the crosshairs of uh, comes through. Um, and so I need to be able to see mistakes to really get a good gauge of, of who they are and how they, how they operate. So those are really the key things that we're looking for at the manager side. At the end of the day, it also it comes down to portfolio fit. So we've found, still have phenomenal managers that I would love to invest with, but it's the second or the third of doing the exact same thing that I've already got. And could I upgrade? Absolutely. There's always opportunities to upgrade, but I don't need to upgrade just to upgrade. I don't need to take action just to take action. Um, and so they'll end up being on our bench and they're calling and they know that we think highly of them. But at the end of the day, I want them to be a good addition to our portfolio and not just more of the same. Um, and, and the other part of that is sometimes you've done all this work and you find great managers. They meet all of those things that I just uh, laid out, but um, a great manager isn't always a great manager for us. Um, it's just not the right fit for what we need and, and it's probably never gonna be a good fit for us. So we'll move on or at least keep them kind of in our in our, in our bench is what I refer to. Much of our audience is populating or are populating databases with the information on their strategies. Are there any other must haves that a manager should be thinking about when it ter in terms of uh, your decision to allocate? So whether that's an AUM level, length of track record, you know, everyone needs to be in the same office versus spread around the world. You know, any other, I hate to call them check boxes, but unfortunately that's generally how we refer to them. So any other check boxes that you think about? 
Yeah, I'm not a checkbox uh, person. Doesn't sound um, like it. <laughs> I wasn't, be before I got to the foundation, I wasn't, and um, I'm definitely not at the foundation. I mean, I think Sir John himself had not only invested where others weren't willing to invest, but also invested with people, talent, where others ha haven't as well. He had seeded strategies, he had seeded people before, talented investors, and I might not have the, the as good of an eye as he has, Actually, I know I don't have as good of an eye as he does, but there are no uh, limitations. So when I think about AUM, the biggest issue I have with AUM is I don't want to be a big part of a fund that if we need to get out of that fund, what does that do to there? Is it, is it a going concern for them um, or does it create liquidity issues for us um, if we're in the fund? But we also often do a lot of SMAs and, uh, and, and that makes things a little bit easier. So AUM is not an issue. You know, people always talk about big teams versus small teams. I'll butcher this quote again as well, but I think Warren Buffett himself used to say committee meetings was him looking in a mirror. And uh, so I think there are phenomenal small teams that are out there, maybe one person shops, quite honestly, uh, that I've met myself that I think are extremely talented, fantastic investors um, and absolutely willing to invest. But there's also robust teams and I think there's value in that too. So I don't have a uh, a desire or a guideline of what I'm looking for. I think there's a, a beauty and a benefit to all of those things. And the same goes for track record. Um, internally, I did in my past, but I still keep what I uh, call a family tree. Um, so I'm always paying attention, not to just to the leaders of every organization or every strategy, but also talented second in commands or senior analysts that are there. And eventually they, they leave, they go off on their own. And uh, I'd like to be ready uh, and invest in those spaces. Um, pr preferably early. I mean, st statistics show that early is often a good thing too in a manager's track record. Um, but it takes a lot of extra work um, to do that. So there's no track record. There's you know maybe no history with that that person. Um, I think you, it's just lazy if you just don't have the opportunity or willingness to, to kind of look at those things. And I think we're absolutely willing to to do that. I mean, I think as they always say, you control your effort, but not the outcome. Um, just constantly putting the effort in and looking and digging further, um, you'll find some fantastic gems. Yeah, interesting. Thanks for sharing. We're gonna talk more about emerging managers over the over the coming conversation, but talking about pi pioneering, uh, Templeton was among the first to invest in Japan in the middle of the 1960s. He had pioneered strategies in industries like nuclear, chemicals, you had mentioned, electronics. So considering that legacy as it relates to the mission, do you, is there a preference? And there may not be based on what you said because there's no check boxes, but when you think about that specialist asset manager who focuses on a specific industry or a specific country relative to the asset managers who can do more than one thing for you or can identify things in, in multiple parts you know, of the economy, is there a preference? So there's not. Um, I like both. <laughs> uh, but what I'd say is uh, there are pitfalls to both as well uh, and opportunities to both. So specialist whether it's a regional manager, whether it's a sector manager, um, a specific focus that they have, they tend to know that space better than anyone else. And there's a there's a benefit to that or an attribute to that that I don't want to dismiss. And also as an allocator, again, using Sir John's kind of views to going in where areas of opportunity exist and dislocation exists, I'll target that specific area and maybe I'll find a specialist that focus in that space. Um, so I love specialists, I'll utilize them uh, when appropriate. I will say I tend to gravitate though to the most flexibility as possible. And it tends to be global, I love global equity strategies for a handful of reasons, but I'll also mention the pitfalls. Um, the reason I like them is that, you know, as an allocator, we're trying to have a top-down view as well and decide is US overvalued? Is China look attractive to us? Um, and these are all general comments. Uh, and, and there's a there's a flaw in making general comments like that. Is the US overvalued? Yes but not the entire U.S. market. Um, and so if a manager can pick the right I ideas inside the U.S. space and then look in Europe, look in China, look in Africa and frontier markets, et cetera, give them that flexibility. They're gonna, they know the market far better than I do and certainly the investment opportunities in that market. Uh, and so that breadth of flexibility is fantastic and it solves my allocation decision, um, but it also gives them the best opportunities that are out there. So when you think about the specialist, the pitfall with a specialist is that Let's say I took a, a European equity manager because I thought Europe was super attractive right now. Um, and they have their top 15 names in their portfolio. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, their 15th name in their portfolio is arguably the 30th or the 50th or the 60th best idea in the investable universe. But I'm investing in that one because that's the space that they're working in. So they're finding the best ideas only in that space. But it might not be 
at the after the first 10 European names, maybe I don't need the other five, but I'm, I allocated to it. So now I'm, I got the third best or the fourth best idea. With a flexible approach, grab the, the top five European names, grab the top five in, in, in the US and, and bring those things together. So there's a lot of, there's a beauty to that flexibility. The problem with flexibility though, uh, that you have to be aware of is that it's too much flexibility leads to what I call anchoring or what many people call anchoring. But uh, at the, even if they say they're benchmark agnostic, they're paying attention to the, the size of NVIDIA and the S&P or the size in the global and the MSCI Acqui, um, the size of Microsoft, Google and, and Meta and these positions. And if they miss those, they don't have those positions because they try to be benchmark agnostic. Um, there's a going concern for them too, or at least a business risk um, from them. And so you tend to see a little bit of anchoring with big flexible strategies that end up owning a lot of the same names as well. Um, and so I like both. I wanna be very careful that all my managers, if they are flexible, aren't gravitating to the same names. And so that might require some more specialists in the portfolio, but my bias on a clean slate would be as much flexibility as possible. So I'm kind of sensing that based off some of your comments earlier as well, um, you talked about how you love analysts and the lead PMs knowing about specific names within their portfolios. Um, so it sounds like you do tend to gravitate toward a more equity uh, strategy. How do you define concentration? What's too much? What's too little? What are your thoughts around that? I keep bringing up Sir John Templeton. Um, uh, by no means do I deserve to connect my name with his, but uh, I happen to work at his foundation, so I guess I get to for, for now. But um, what I would say is that uh, he was big on concentration, um, finding talented investors and getting their best ideas um, in a portfolio. So the idea of a 60, 70 stock portfolio probably wasn't his ideal fit. He really wanted to know what the best ideas were. Um, and so I take that to heart and certainly look for managers that can concentrate as much as possible. But I also, again, see value in more diversified portfolios too. But generally speaking, we look for best ideas when it comes to specific managers, talented managers that are out there. So keep in mind, I should say, I'm also concentrated by asset class. There's a lot of asset classes I don't have. So I already have two layers of pretty significant concentration that are out there. So once I move past the manager at that point, now I'm trying to create diversification as much as I possibly can. And that's those lenses I talked about on the risk side, understanding what I own, where these managers not only have been, but where they're going based off of their approach, based off of their philosophy to investing, where they see their risks. I'm always talking about their forward looking thoughts um, and helps shape not only my views, but again, um, help shape how I would allocate. Like it could be position sizing, could be what I'm missing in the portfolio. So concentration is multi-layered, but I think at that third layer, once I've kind of embodied what Sir John had, had wanted to do at, at our foundation, um, I'd really try and focus on diversification. And, you know, you think about other foundations that have these private assets that have been kind of muted in terms of their, their the letdown or the, the mark to marks that they've had. We don't have that. Uh, 2022 was a tough year for us. Portfolio goes down and I need to mitigate as much risk as I possibly can, not just for okay geometrically how the portfolio can grow long-term, but also for our grants team. Um, think about the volatility and the out of that, that capital. Uh, even if you have rolling past periods, it still has a lot of volatility to it and that's disruptive on their end. And so I wanna be able to smooth that as much as possible without degrading returns. And um, so it, it's, it's a double-edged sword, but we're, we're looking for concentration and then diversification thereafter. Well, bringing in the foundation's philanthropic work to the investment discussion, uh, the foundation believes that the cultivation of good character enables people to create lives of purpose and meaning per the, uh, per the website. Uh, you also believe that people uh, who practice good character are motivated to serve others and work for the common good. So how do you evaluate strong character in your managers? So we've talked a lot about the process. We've talked a lot about the strategy, concentration versus more diverse. But when it's all said and done, it's about the people. So another way to ask this is how do you evaluate the people behind the investment decision? Yeah, I've, impossible to answer. Um, we try our best, I would say. Um, last week I was with a uh, well-known portfolio manager, Brett Barraquette of Tremblant Capital. Um, and I think he said it best. Uh, one thing that I, I, I'll take with me, um, but he said, you know, when people do one thing wrong in their life or inappropriate in their life, they tend to do more things inappropriate in their life. Um, and so we can absolutely kind of dig in and do background checks and kind of, you can scour the universe, the, you know, the internet and, and find things about people. And if you do find something, that's a, obviously a easy red flag. And 
uh, even if it has nothing to do with investing, I, I'll move on. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities out there. I don't need to mix in with, with problems that are out there. So that's one part. But I'd also say it's, it's at the end of the day, most people are, appear to be uh, good stewards and good, good people. So it's very difficult to kind of sit across the table and, and assess that. Uh, I go back to humility. I think just trying to read that person uh, is, is one difficult, but also um, part of the art in terms of finding great managers. Um, so what do I do? I tend to ask questions that have nothing to do with the answer that I'm looking for because everyone knows exactly what, how they'd respond to a specific question. So I'm triangulating what I really want to know about them. Um, sometimes kind of pulling them in with uh, easy questions, maybe even pulling them in with views of mine that would lead them to, to a certain uh, direction. So uh, that's one thing I, I think is important for, as an analyst is never ask the question that you want the hard answer to. Uh, you need to ask around that question to get the real answer. Um, but the other part I'd say is one of my flaws is I tend to meet with managers. As soon as I walk out, I'm like, wow, that was a fantastic meeting because they always come across so smooth and polished. And the process, I shouldn't say all the time, but it happens often. Um, and I always need to kind of reassess, come back to the fundamentals, come back to the data. And so I never really like to talk about a, ma a manager with my colleagues right after a meeting, even a day or so after the meeting. Um, wait a couple days, maybe a week, go back to the data, compare them to other managers you've met objectively uh, and see if you really have a story there. Uh, and so sometimes being too close to managers becomes a problem. And so I try and keep a pretty arm's length, uh, especially for prospective managers in that regard. That makes a lot of sense. Well, speaking of doing good or trying to do good, what are your general views on impact investing as it relates to active management with company management? So we don't hear about activist investing quite as often as we used to. Um, but as you're thinking about these relatively concentrated portfolios, you know, particularly in small cap, uh, there's, there's a bigger stick. So how do you think about that, that, that approach? Yeah, activism is great. I mean, we don't have a set policy on um, impact investing and in ESG or any component um, internally. But do we look for activist managers? Absolutely. I think there's a value there. Um, you know, at the end of the day, as long as they're doing good things for the company, good things for the people that work there, good things for the surrounding environment, and of course, for the investor themselves, uh, I would support active uh, activists uh, and what they're trying to do in terms of turning companies around. So. We've invested in strategies that, um, uh, in my historical past, that uh, are activists or try and approach that. Maybe they're soft activists to some extent. And that includes not just here in the US, but in Japan in particular, uh, with norms and cultures, to be very uh, aware of how optically you look um, or how outbound you, you, you look. So there's, a, there's a, certainly a benefit there. I wouldn't say we have a strong desire to seek them out or avoid them. It's really about the end of the day, what can they bring to us? And do they bring something different than we already have? We mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, merger managers, and just curious to hear your thoughts on um, how you and your team review emerging managers, whether you have a specific sleeve for emerging managers or um, they're just implemented into the overall portfolio. Um, and if you do look at emerging managers, what, how do you define an emerging manager? Everyone kind of does that differently from a firm AUM level, strategy AUM level. Um, love to just kind of hear your thoughts and your views. So first I would say how I would define emerging. I would say new and unfound uh, or undiscovered. Um, so Dan Sunheim launching D1 in 2018 is not in, un, you know, unknown. Uh, that's not an emerging manager. Um, but I think there are a lot of phenomenal investment managers that are out there that are completely kind of off the radar and just unfortunately being, being missed. We want to seek those out. Um, so uh, the, on the sleeve, um, I would say uh, tying this a little bit into DEI, um, there's a desire by the industry to kind of combine emerging and DEI. And I don't like that. Um, specifically around what you just said, which is the sleeve. Um, you know, I think there are some, some talented exceptional investors that are women and minority owned or operated uh, and they get sleeved right into the small allocation that uh, everybody feels good that they're doing something but uh, it, it's disrespectful quite honestly and I think um, my job is to find phenomenal investors emerging experienced or you know, long track record whatever you want to define that um, who they are where they came from um, all of that doesn't matter uh, to me, I want to find best opportunities and diversification plays a big role in that. Um, so 
definitely don't sleeve, um, but definitely try and incorporate in the essence of diversification, bringing in emerging strategies and emerging people into the industry is really critical for me. That's great, Brian. Thank you for sharing that. It, you did mention this, that the emerging manager space is, is an area where investors have been able to expand their approach to women and minority uh, owned investment firms. So how do you approach DEI then as it relates to the portfolio? It, it sounds like you're looking for the best manager, but as you do think about you know, the importance of you know, diversifying the book as it relates to um, underrepresented you know, folks in the industry, what are your, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, mean, I think there's been a lot of great strides taken in the DEA, DEI space. It's still a tiny, tiny move in terms of what's happened. Um, and I take that as an opportunity for me. I think there are so many undiscovered, talented investors that um, just don't have the assets yet. Um, and if I can find those before my allocators, absolutely, I, I'd love to, to do that. And I take it from a position of diversification. So when I think about all the, we've talked about diversification a lot today, but um, geography, sector, how they think, their approach to investment, all of those things matter. And a lot of those are measurable, but then you also have a person's background, um, how they grew up, what influences they have in their life, where they go to school. Um, uh, and yes, race and sex play a role as well. And, and I think those components of how that influences their approach to investment brings a different lens to my portfolio um, and so I, I've said this uh, internally at the foundation and I've said it many times in my past, but if I had you know, a portfolio that's completely diversified on paper, different asset classes, different geographies, but at the end of the day, you kind of peeled the, the onion on the back a little bit and you found out that they're all of the same race, the same sex, they all went to the same school, they all hang out in the same club after, you know, the racket club or whatever afterwards, I have a big problem. Um, in terms of diversification, even if on paper, they're all over the place. Um, so I want people from different backgrounds. I want uh, all of those different lenses to take place. So I approach DEI not with a intention to find DEI uh, or women and minority owned firms, but with a selfish uh, intent to diversify the portfolio with great investors. And that doesn't have to be just women and minorities. I have a, uh, one of my investments is in uh, a strategy that's based in Denmark and there are two white males that run that, but they're, they, I mean, how many strategies are based in Denmark? Um, and they have a very different approach or view of the world than most of the US or New York based firms that are out there. So I find value in that and that's not DEI, but that's diversification. And I'll apply that to finding fantastic women and minority owned firms too. Well, you've given us an, a number of quotes this episode so far. So I'll give you a, a Templeton quote. If you go to 10 doctors and they tell you the same medicine, that's what you're gonna take. If you go to 10 engineers to build a bridge and they tell you the same thing, that's the bridge you're gonna build. But if you go to 10 investment advisors and they pick out the same asset, you better stay away from it. So how do you strike a balance between being a contrarian and then you know, having the more popular view on a, on a manager. So first that popular view, uh, I'm thinking about asset classes in particular, as opposed to contrarian investing. Um, and um, it's hard to ignore that. Uh, I was just um, at a conference talking about um, leaders in de certain decades. And we've seen, you've probably seen the studies yourself, but uh, oil stocks in the seventies, Japanese stocks in the eighties, and they weren't the leaders the following decade. In this past decade, we've had all these big growth tech stocks that have really led, are they gonna lead in the next 10 years? But if you're not exposed there and they are continuing to lead, um, you're gonna miss out. Um, so there is this kind of populist view that you wanna have that momentum and have that exposure in your portfolio. But I would say that whether it's the namesake of our foundation, Sir John and his views about contrarian investing, and quite honestly, that being carried through to the board, to my investment committee, to the people I work with at the staff level, um, that long-term lens affords me the opportunity to really be contrarian and think long-term. Uh, and so, you know, Sir John used to always talk, uh, long-term was in centuries, not in years, um, and, and minimum decades. So I think that I have a pretty long leash in terms of taking some contrarian views in our portfolio. And if we're wrong for five or six or even seven years, um, I think that, um, they would understand that. We rarely talk about what happened in the last quarter, the last year in terms of performance. It's really about that forward looking and contrarian opportunities. When I was a consultant, I used to always say, um, foundations are designed to live in perpetuity, but they're managed by people with short term views. Um, 
and, and I'm speaking of committees, I'm speaking of the consultants, um, because we're always thinking about how can we outperform, get that extra 50 bips above benchmark or, you know, those kind of things. This, how do we do this year? Oh, what have you done for me lately? Um, I don't have that I, pressure uh, at all. I have a fantastic investment committee, a uh, fantastic boss, a CEO, uh, and the board and the, as well, uh, fully embrace Sir John's long-term view and extremely long-term view uh, and allows, I think, a lot of um, leeway in terms of digging in for those opportunities and thinking about those. In that context, how are you thinking about private markets? You had mentioned that private credit is an area that you're starting to explore. So thinking about that area of the market that was not a historic allocation, it's something new that you're working on today. So just the, your general views on where you see private markets specifically with maybe some opportunities that you're starting to apply that research process to in private credit. Yeah, we're, we're, we're certainly looking. I would say that um, I'm very happy to be on the sidelines right now. Um, you know, it was painful in 2022 being mostly in Publix, uh, almost all in Publix. And uh, and it wasn't just equities. We saw bonds. I mean, the ag lost 13, 14% last year. Um, so there really wasn't a hiding place for uh, someone like myself uh, in 2022. And then you look at a lot of endowment and foundation portfolios there. Uh, the, the downside was much more muted. But I don't know if you've seen charts recently, but there's still a pretty big gap between public equities and private markets. And they've historically run pretty tight in terms of kind of valuations, at least the gap between them. Um, and there's there's a still a huge gap there. So whether that comes through in markdowns or whether there's just kind of a lower return profile over the next couple of years for private investments, I'm very happy to be on the sidelines um, in the short term. Um, granted, we need to timestamp this, this interview because I think <laughs> three years from now, I'll sound like an idiot because uh, I think if you thought super long term, uh, we all know private investments have historically added five, six, 700 basis points above public equities. Um, and when you think about, I'm a, I work at a private foundation, we have a minimum spin level, uh, we have inflation to think about. And if you've looked at it over the last 25 years, I wanna say, I'll get, I'll, don't quote me on the exact number, but in, in say, equity, global equities, I think are up 6.8% annualized over the last 25 years, that includes bull runs in, 90, in the late 90s, that includes 03 to 06, that includes the post GFC run, 6.8%. Um, and then bonds are even less than that. So where am I getting eight to 9% in the public markets? It's gonna be a really hard battle other than alpha generation and position sizing and all these things. And so, yeah, is there an interest in, in private investments? Absolutely, if you can think long-term, I think there's an opportunity there. But again, like I said before, I think the way we're built, um, we're going to stay in the kind of the public, transparent, liquid uh, space in majority of the portfolio. And I think there's opportunities there too. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully capitalize on those. Well, if it doesn't work out, I take comfort knowing that you'll own your mistake based on what you had <laughs> said earlier. So that we appreciate you sharing that. Absolutely. So, I mean, there is a lot going on right now and from a macro perspective. Um, how are you and the team looking to maybe capitalizing on that? Um, if there are any opportunities that you are looking at over you know, through year end 2023 um, and into 2024 over yeah. the next, you know, six to 12 months. Yeah. I mean, I think, as I said before, what I love so much about the investment industry is that it's always changing and there's always new elements or new events that are taking place. But I think you can always step back to the fundamentals and think long term, even within a short term environment. Um, and so whatever I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the opportunity of the next kind of it, it'll be dead in by March uh, or June, hopefully it's a five, seven, 10, 20 year opportunity uh, that's out there. Um, and when there's massive dislocations, I think those opportunities, the, long, the, the longevity of those opportunities can start to really come through. Uh, and so what are we looking at in the public equity space outside of continuing to kind of look for quality um, strategies with a discipline around valuation, I think is super attractive to me. I think that there is a, uh, a, a strong debate between uh, valuations and solvencies right now. And which risk do you wanna take on? And when I think about valuations or when I think about good quality companies, little debt, strong free cash flow, tons of cash sitting on their books already, they have the ability to grow, ability to buy others. Those are the Magnificent Seven right now. Those are, that's Meta, Google, Microsoft. Maybe they won't be that way five years from now, but right now they are the high quality companies based off of balance sheet and income statement data. Um, but they're, they're still highly priced. Um, and then you look at 
small and mid cap value names, uh, whether we're talking about regional banks or we're talking about kind of the broader space, there's a lot of debt that's embedded in those companies. And going from zero rates in terms of that debt and that debt starting to roll over to having to pay five, six, seven percent, whatever debt interest costs that they have, there's a real going concern. There's a solvency issue that may exist in the small cap space, but there's also, a, those are some great opportunities to invest. And so we're exploring kind of the small mid cap value space pretty heavily, um, being patient, um, but, but ca uh, cautious, but seeing some opportunities there. Right now, nobody likes China. Um, I was just sitting with a, um, uh, a portfolio manager that invests in Asia. And he had mentioned he was over at a meeting with a, a company that, um, a very a large cap company that had uh, an investor day. And he was the only foreign investor that was in the entire room. Uh, and uh, so there's just no interest in China right now, which that's actually perks my interest, um, quite honestly. And I know there's geopolitical risks. There are uh, many other risks. I mean, China right now imports into the US just reached a 20 year low. We're back to 2004 levels in terms of imports in the US. So this deglobalization is real uh, and it's a massive impact, but China continues to be, it's still a second largest consumer, 18% of GDP, just some fantastic, um, I think green shoots over the long term, and these geopolitical things um, are probably aren't going away anytime soon. But there's also opportunities in there as well. I was um, talking with past managers that I had that owned um, the private tutoring, some or, or investments in private tutoring. If you remember in 2021, China kind of butchered uh, the private tutoring space, and those companies fell off completely. New Oriental, Tal, others. Um, if you look at them today, they've actually been up six, seven fold, some of them uh, already. So it's kind of like working its way through and there's, you know, why didn't I see that opportunity? Um, so being willing to kind of be contrarian and jump into those opportunities, that goes back to the specialist manager conversation as well. There's opportunities to invest when nobody else wants to. And that's what I'm looking for. So whether it's kind of in the valuation camp um, or whether it's outside of the U.S., you know, in the last piece I'll touch on that is completely untapped, I think, still today, even though people have talked about it for about 10 years, and that's Africa. Uh, whether it's private or public investing, people still haven't really d d dived in uh, with two feet into the Africa uh, space. And, you know, arguably working off a clean slate, they are so much, there's so much opportunity to really see some leverageable uh, investment um, gains coming in that space. Uh, and so we're exploring frontier markets in general, but uh, Africa, uh, if we can. I was asked once uh, by a member of the board, you know, Sir John, back in the 50s and 60s, invested in Japan when no one else did, um, or very few people did. And that was a, a big leap. Is there any market out there that's kind of like that today? And I'd argue Africa might be the only space that's left that is still untapped and arguably unloved. And if I can find opportunities there, I will. I'm just curious on that point with Africa. We've had a few guests who are starting to explore the space. What, what does the opportunity set look like from a manager perspective? Yeah, it's super thin. I mean, there aren't um, a lot, especially on the public side, which is where I tend to obviously focus on um, much more on the private side. Uh, we've seen some opportunities there. It's been infrastructure. Uh, you've seen some some energy plays in that space, uh, but nothing kind of on the, not, I shouldn't say nothing, but not a lot on the consumer side, which is where I'd love to more marketable uh, investment opportunities and more global reach. Um, and I, but I think they're coming. Uh, and so I just don't want to be watching others do it uh, at the beginning. Uh, and once things are kind of the, the foundations there and the, the fundamentals are there to be ready to invest in that space. I think people have kind of been invested in that space, got burned, and now they just don't touch it. Um, and I get that, but they were probably early to the space. You know, I, um, I got the opportunity of sitting at a fireside chat recently with uh, someone by the name of Chris Ellis, who's um, River, uh, uh, Riverwood uh, Capital. Sorry, I forgot his name, big venture capitalist. And he mentioned um, who, what, when, where, why. Uh, and only in our industry is it the win that matters the most. Uh, and we're not market timers. We're not trying to time anything. But, you know, if you're thinking long term, entry points play a ma massive role. Every single recommendation I bring to my committee, I talk about entry points. Is this, uh, are we buying at the top? Are we investing at the wrong time with this kind of strategy? Uh, and if it's done well in the recent past, why do I think it could continue? Entry points are really important. And I think Africa, going back to, to that opportunity set, 
will be important as well. So those that have burned, been burned, maybe they don't come back, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we're exploring that right now. Well, we are moving into the home stretch here. And you had mentioned a, a couple of times that you know things can move quickly. We don't want to time the market, but that, saying, that said, rather, uh, it, it's a fast evolving landscape. So when you think about uh, when you've been in those moments in your career where you had to venture into uncharted territory, so how that experience shaped your approach to manager research. Things are changing all around us, whether it's the great financial crisis or you had mentioned the events in China as it related to private tutoring and industry being completely wiped out over the matter of days, if not weeks. You know, how, do you, how, do you look, how have you looked at those, those opportunities or those events? Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on two. Uh, and the first is one you've probably heard before, but COVID changed the way we do due diligence mm -hmm. um, for at least a short amount of time. We're back on the road now, which is fantastic, getting to sit side by side managers and look them in the eye. But, um, you know, Zoom, as great as it was, it still is great. Uh, it does have, it lacks a, a little bit of uh, the read or being able to really assess a manager uh, clearly. Um, and we, quite honestly, we relied quite a bit on reference calls, background checks, kind of stayed in our own lane for a, a number of months and if not years. And so, uh, that was kind of a rewriting of that process. Um, so you, we knew, and we already talked about it today, but kind of the process of what we would do, the iterative steps we would take, which includes multiple onsites um, with a manager, that just didn't happen during COVID. And we needed to pivot, pivot quite a bit. Um, and uh, I think that was successful, thank God for technology. Uh, 20 years ago when Zoom or video chats just either didn't exist or the quality wasn't there. Uh, it would have been really tough, but um, uh, uh, technology really stepped up in a, in a big way, uh, or the use of technology did. Um, the other thing I would mention is probably a little bit more long term, um, but it's a it's a change that uh, I think many people kind of ignored or didn't think about quite. But at least I, I didn't, and that's that. You know, people like Sir John Templeton and and other great investors that have have were around in the '80s and the '90s, and then they retired and moved on. There were few and far between. There weren't. There, there. We can all name them on two hands. The great investors of the of that time frame, at least in the public equity space. Uh, but as the universe has grown so much, there are now thousands and thousands of managers, and that um, generation that was leading the firms, that generation that's the 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 strong voice in the room, the 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 person we're investing with, the key man that people always label. Um, they're they're retiring. Or, or worse, they're passing. Um, and we're moving on to that next generation. And immediately, um, as an analyst, we've tended to say, well, when there's a change like this, we, we wanna see it from the sidelines. We'll step away, come out of the strategy completely, and let's see how this works out. Um, and that might've worked when there were one or two of those happening. But I think as this kind of growth in the industry has led to now, we're at that point where we're seeing first generation of a bigger basket of investment managers kind of come to retirement, we have this next generation coming in, we need to rethink that transition and understand if it's smooth, if it's not smooth, and be prepared ahead of time um, on who that next generation talent is going to be and, and underwrite that just as much as we're underwriting the, the person that's been leading the firm for so long. And I think that goes back to my family tree com conversation, but uh, understanding who the next layer of talent uh, exist at those organizations. So you're not taking these knee jerk reactions to change. Yeah, I agree. It's an exciting time. A lot of these next generation managers, whether you want to bucket them into the emerging manager pool, uh, are, are really presenting a lot of interesting opportunities. So it sounds like you're doing the work. So we appreciate it. Well, uh, Sir John Templeton attributed much of his success to his ability to maintain an elevated mood, uh, avoid anxiety, and stay disciplined. So what would you attribute your success as it relates to manager selection and portfolio construction? I'll stick with discipline because because the others are not uh, my my strong suit. Yeah, you haven't been able to avoid anxiety? Not at all. <laughs> uh, in fact, I think if you've talked to any committee member that I've ever worked with in my past, um, they know that I stress about everything. Um, I'm, um, I, I worry about everything. I think about, I overthink things, even internally at my old firm or today, I used to pick apart portfolios and try and question returns and make sure they're just exactly right and that you capture even like I said before, I think every basis point matters and I want to make sure it's exactly right. And what else could I be doing a little bit better? And um, so I stress about all of those things. I think though, what I would say is that I don't let that stress or that anxiety dictate my decisions. Uh, and I, so I always fall back on discipline and the fundamentals that have, uh, I've been taught 
uh, throughout the years, whether it's a uh, quotes from Sir John, I wish I would have met him uh, in person, but you know, uh, reading books from, from him, from Buffett, Graham, et cetera, all these great investors that just give you the principles and, 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 um, and steady discipline to invest uh, uh, on an objective basis and not let the anxiety kind of come through. So I think there's a healthy benefit to having to worry uh, about quite a bit. Um, but never let it actually dictate or make decisions inside the portfolio unless they're warranted with the fundamental support. Thank you for sharing all of that. It was very interesting. Um, I'm going to share one more Templeton quote with you. Uh, to be successful in investing, you need to keep changing your ideas. So with a long-term horizon as it relates to the foundation's mission, uh, which, which you very eloquently described to us over the course of this conversation, how do you approach the ability to remain flexible uh, in your views on markets and managers in the context of your long-term goals? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think all of the things we've talked about today kind of come together in, the, in that, that question, or, or I guess my answer to that. And that's, um, you know, it's one of the things I love most about the investment space is it's always changing, but it repeats itself. Um, so there are always things that are new, new events, new factors, bubbles come, bubbles burst, opportunities arise. And I just think that you're never bored. You always, there's always new things to look at and you're always humbled uh, by being wrong, uh, but uh, finding those new opportunities that exist out there. And that's uh, super exciting, uh, but marry that with those long-term fundamentals. Uh, like I said before, um, opportunities can arise, but if you can see the fundamentals behind them and if the dislocation is big enough, it's going to take some time for those to really play through. So I'd, one, I'd, I mentioned before, I'm not a market timer, so I don't have to get the entry point just right, but I wanna see that dis dislocation, I wanna invest, and you can invest for the long term. And I think marrying up um, that fundamental contrarian approach to investment with an ever-changing environment that's always given us new opportunities is super exciting. And I think you can be flexible yet long-term uh, at the same time. Thank you for sharing that. Well, we always like to close the show with a question about the people who influenced you, the advice that you received over the course of your career. Who are some of the mentors who have been most important to you? I've had a lot, um, so I won't go through all of them. I, I, I maybe speak to the more recent ones uh, that have been meant a lot to me. I'll call them mentors. I don't know if they know they're my mentors, but um, they, <laughs> well, they're going to find out they, now. They've meant a lot to me. <laughs> uh, the first is uh, Keith Ferguson, who's the uh, CIO at uh, Washington University. Actually gave me quite a bit of career advice uh, over the last probably 10 years. Um, so he and I have talked uh, a handful many times um, about uh, investment opportunities. And he's definitely given, given me a lot of guidance in that space as well. And being willing to kind of um, plant your flag uh, say who you are and what you want to focus on and, and do it. Uh, and he's done that at his, his endowment. And I think he's done a, obviously a fantastic job. Um, and, um, uh, so that's part of the, the investment uh, advice that he's given me, but he's also given me fantastic career advice. Um, and the other one, uh, another CIO, Joseph Botang, who runs Casey family programs, um, has an incredible level of insight and the ability to digest information yet remain completely disciplined throughout his entire thought process. And uh, it's so much fun to just sit and have a conversation with him and talk about where the opportunities lie, but then come back to all the pitfalls and all the problems that, that those opportunities might have. And it kind of grounds you. Um, and so he's a fantastic soundboard for um, investment ideas that I'm, I'm thinking about. Brian, thank you for planting your flag here with us for the last hour. It's been wonderful. Congratulations on all your success. Three years at the Templeton Foundation. We wish you many more years of uh, success going forward. So thank you for being here on the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. If you want to learn more about Brian and the John Templeton Foundation, please visit their website at www.templeton.org. You can find this episode and past episodes on Spotify, Apple, Google, or your favorite podcast platform. We are also available on YouTube if you prefer to watch while you listen. If you would like to catch up on past episodes, check out our website at dakota.com. Finally, if you like what you're seeing and hearing, please be sure to like, follow, and share these episodes. We welcome your feedback as well. Brian, thank you again for joining us today. Steve, as always, and to our audience, thank you for investing your time with Dakota. Don't say goodbye.